Recording in progress. Okay, okay. I'm going to call the meeting of the Holiday Island Planning Commission to order. Uh, it's uh, November 9th at 3.05 in the afternoon. I think we'll dispense with the pledge since we just said it an hour ago at the last meeting. We may have uh, changed our mind. <laughs> Lynn, you want to call the uh, roll? Chairman Keyes? Here. Vice Chair Pittman? Here. Commissioner Elwood? Here. Commissioner Graves? Here. Commissioner Mills? Here. Secretary Dumas? <coughs> here. All present. All right. And I it believe should be noted we have one person visiting us via Zoom. Uh, we have, technically, we have two because Wes is here. Wes is here. And and a distinguished resident of Holiday Island. You're one. Is anybody on Zoom? Yeah, I said one. One? Okay. Oh, so we got three people. Um, all right, uh, I believe there was minutes from the last meeting to approve. Meeting from October 19, our last regular meeting. They were distributed. I made you can bring a copy me. with me. I approved the minutes from the outside of it. Ken moved to approve the minutes. Pat. Seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> They're approved. Okay, come on back up. And at this point, I'm going to turn the discussion over to Lynn. The rest of our agenda, we have no standing reports and no old business. <clears throat> the new business is a discussion about uh, uh, proposed zoning regulations. And I've distributed uh, copies of uh, documents that I acquired after looking at multiple cities and landed on a community named Taunty Town in Arkansas. They happen to be represented by the same attorney that we do. So I thought that would be a, a good basis point. And the model that I picked, be, I picked it because it was simpler than some and it covered a lot of the bases that I think we need covered in a, in a text type format. Um, as uh, we've talked in the past, there were uh, others that were more than a few hundred pages long of lots of detail and we may get that get that far someday but I think we don't need to be that far for now. <clears throat> I did distribute a, a copy of an outline which basically is just a little bit of a rearrangement of the topics that are covered in the, in the uh, zoning regulations that are here. But I wanted to point out that uh, because the city has made uh, decision in its land use plan to, I put in quotes, to defend the covenants. In other words, to uh, do as much as we can to make certain that the covenants that are in place on our properties are supported by ordinances that we pass. That those covenants are awkward in the way that they uh, describe how land is used for zoning and uh, mainly because it's by unit and block rather than like <clears throat> Tommy Town has you know, like most cities, they have square streets and nice straight lines and they have neighborhoods they define easily. Even though they, they have a business <coughs> district because the highway runs through town, they, they are simple, their plans are simple. Ours may be a little more difficult to uh, describe other than sticking with the uh, descriptions of unit, block, and lot that uh, our, our properties are named after. The uh, covenants in our land use the names are not the same in the regulations that I copied. And I didn't want to go to that effort of uh, recommending new names yet. I want to make sure that we have uh, what um, zones that we need to describe before I work with trying to match them up with what's in the current uh, covenants. And um, the, con the uh, conditional use isn't defined in the covenants. Conditional use when you say, an area is going to be an R1, and someone comes to you and said, I'd like to put a, a mom and pop candy shop on the corner. So you, they're asking for a, a, a variation. None of that is described in our current covenants. What they've done is take exceptions that all of this unit is a certain um, land use, except for certain blocks and lots are separated out. So they, they took it in that method rather than giving a conditional use within a unit. So that's going to create a little bit of work on our part and how we're going to describe uh, what's permitted, how, how activities are going to take place. So, and then the, the basic thing, or the, the thing that I thought was really significant is our current covenants don't have definition section. 
when you look at the Arkansas statutes like under alcohol, there's a four page document describing what all the terms in the law mean. Uh, when I look at other covenants, including this, or not covenants, when I look at other zoning regulations, including this one for Tawnytown, they do have an extensive description so that it takes the, uh, helps take away the arguments of, well, I want to use it for this, but it really isn't that. And we in our ordinance can point to a, a use that's described, and you can see if what they want to do matches one of those, and then we can go to our other ordinance that says it's permitted or it's uh, permitted under conditional use or it's not permitted at all. So there is an extensive uh, definition section in this set of regs that I, that I recommend that we review. So any questions to that point? Jan. I didn't intend for uh, the conversation today to be me doing all the talking. I was hoping that you know there'd be a lot of input from you folks. And my plan then was just to go through that document, starting with page four of the front end, and just scan through issues that I have highlighted that I think need some attention on our part that are in the, the document. I use a, a naming or a marking scheme of the yellow would be words that I added to the, the document for clarity to identify it as ours. <clears throat> then I use the blue highlight for areas that I think need attention, things that I don't think fit necessarily with Holiday Island or we need to even take out entirely to replace. Okay. Uh, the ones you marked reserved. Uh, the sections I marked reserved? Yeah. Those are topics that uh, we don't think uh, need to be addressed right away. I just took the text entirely out. Okay. Landscaping, screening, fencing, you, you don't think? Was, that, 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 I thought I saw that in the. Okay. It's not included here. It was in the original uh, 117 page piece that I sent, but in the 69 page version, it, it, I took the text out for landscaping, okay. screening, and fencing. So those three, those four issues are not in the. Uh, yeah, there's more than that, but yes. Yeah. There's well, there's flag standards, yeah. There's quite a few that are marked reserved, like landfill for uh, exclusive use landfills and planned unit developments. The goal is to get zoning ordinances in place so that we have more than what we have in our land use plan that simply says we're going to do the best we can to defend what's in the covenants. So when the planning commission meets in the near future or a, um, what's his title? Uh, the, the guy that does the building permits. Uh, yeah, the building inspector. The building inspector, when he sees plans, yeah. he'll know that, well, we're going to have to rely on the covenants until we get zoning regulations in place. Okay. The sooner we do this, the better off we're going to be uh, for the builders and for the residents of Holiday Island. Okay, so, and all these things where you got the yellow mark, that's where you added your own wording. Yes. The tiny town. Okay. Yes. Okay. And, okay. I was wondering, um, you left the Board of Zoning Adjustment and the Administration and Enforcement at the end of the code, like I suppose it was in the Tawny Town Code. Well, in the numbering scheme that's on there, the 14 dot number is mm -hmm. what's in the Tawny, Tawny Town Code. The 14 is mine. It, theirs is actually 153 if you go do your own research, but I just replaced it with 14. I moved it to the end because I kind of thought it was logical that we would have the rules of the construction, how this thing is put together, uh, the 100s, or in this reference 100, the establishment of the districts and boundaries, and then actually naming them with uh, how they're going to be used, and the accessory uses, and then some conditional applicable certain uses as a list, and then the general standards of, well, these are the dimensions and that kind of thing, and then non-conforming is not like everything else, so it's different. This flood thing I thought was uh, governmental, so I'd leave it in there for at least the start, and then put the administration part at the end. Okay, I was just wondering whether, because you might be referring to those areas in previous chapters, whether it would be better to have them at the beginning or not. It was just a yeah. The the convention well, that flew yeah. through my head. <laughs> the convention that's used in their rates is to reference them by number. You know, per 
for zoning. So you could look at it. You'd say, yeah, you'd say 14.261 or something like that. Okay, so, so that, that's just the, the scheme of arranging it. So as I started down this document, I'm, I'm scanning down this, and on page six, I made no notes that are any different from this text. And that's why I was hoping that we, you know, as far as the discussion would be, if you guys have read this, you know, this is pretty weird, or this doesn't really fit. Did you make any marks like that in your, in your research? If not, we'll just go with what I've marked. Here's a general question I had. Okay. I think I can say it. Um, that, you know, they have so many more zones than yes. we have in the covenant. Mm -hmm. it's, it's broken down into way more mm -hmm. level of detail. Do we need to go there? No, I don't think so. I think we need to design these with what the, the covenants have in them. Okay. And that's why I said so I that's didn't... your thought for... How, what, we what we'll end up to. with, yes. Okay. Yeah, I just left all that there so that if nothing else, it's like, oh, it sparks a thought. Maybe we should have a zone for the future. And that's that's one thing. I, when I was thinking about the, the commercial areas and the descriptions and the definitions, that the sooner we put things in place, the better off we're going to be in the future. So if someone doesn't come to me or come to our, our planning commission meeting and say, I want to do such and such in this area, and I'm going to do it because you don't say yeah, I can't. And so we would be putting the fences up and not have to try to close the gate after they've come through. Would, would having more of those zones uh, create less opportunity for conditional use? They probably would. But we should be wise about what we say they're zoned for so we don't create a, a negative impact. But what we want to do is preserve the safety and the, the welfare and those five words that are used in the codes that we're uh, supposed to do to protect our community. So, you know, if, if we're looking at a, a parcel that isn't zoned by a current covenant and say, well, you know, they could build a, a, a three-story office building in the middle of that uh, area, but, well, the neighbors might not think that's too hot, so we would probably zone it against that. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I had a thought, but then I, I uh, answered my own question. Okay. I was thinking, you know, with, with you, you made a comment about limiting the opportunity or the need for con con conditional use permits. Um, I don't think we want to discourage uh, issuing uh, conditional use permits, um, uh, especially if it's, if it's an existing situation. Let's say that there's there's a, um, a unit here that says you can't, uh, I don't know, you can't uh, have a, uh, an ice cream shop on the corner, but somebody has an ice cream shop on the corner. So it's grandfathering. Yeah, I so rather than rather than saying, okay, well we're going to zone that one property commercial so that they can have their ice cream shop and won't need a conditional use permit. I think we would want to issue a conditional use permit because. If at any point in the future they stop being a ice cream shop, then that conditional use permit goes away. Or they sold the property in the next one. Right. To be any, anything that changes, anytime something changes to the status of that property, that conditional use permit can be made to go away, and then they would have to conform to the rest of the let me, let me, area. I mean, now that just spurred my thought. The, the property over here across the street, which is all zone commercial, but is largely residential on Blue Water. But it's, is it residential or is it short-term rentals? It, you, well, that, that, that can't be commercial anymore, apparently, right? Short-term rental is commercial. Well, I mean, if it's a B&B, &B. if it's a residence used as a short-term rental on Airbnb, I think yeah. somebody circulated something recently that said but that's, that's against the law. To make I, I think we need to look at that further because, again, that, that may not set general precedent. 
the the uh, some of the things like blue water, I think Unit 10 is a real mixed bag of zoning. Unit 10 is R2, C1, and C2 according to the covenants. Mm -hmm. The C's are, they, there's some conflicts between units when they call it C1 or C2. Yeah. So, like these condos, on, the condos on Blue Water, you know, may not be a, a violation of the covenant because it allows for that. Um, now, mm -hmm. going up the street here, <coughs> I was told that Perry Presley was allowed to build those houses because there's nothing in the covenant that says you can't build residential in a commercial. You can't, the covenants say you can't build commercial in a residential, but somebody told me that, that there's nothing that says you can't um, do residential in a commercial. And it came up, it came up up in the, uh, up in the park. When the, the guy that owned the pavilion and stuff there before, um, before uh, Brad Handley bought it, mm -hmm. um, he was actually living on that property oh, at one time. And he they had said his they own couldn't. unit though. He, huh? he was his own unit. Um, mm. I remember when that property sold, it was in his own unit. Can, can and they wrote a covenant strictly for that unit. I thought that that was in the same unit as the Elswad. Well, it might be, oh. but I think it's separate. How are we going? Okay, anyway. Anyway. How are we going through this anyway? I don't well, know. I'm trying to get back to it. We're going to cover one page at a time. Okay, let's do that. Then right. I don't know where the hell I'm at. All right, on top of page seven. <laughs> let's get control of this meeting here. Back up, yeah. Top of page seven in the document, it's 14.021. Okay. <clears throat> the very second sentence, it says, it also contains definitions for the uses identified in the text, and I inserted or intended to be used at a later date. Mm -hmm. To answer Linda's question and my response a moment ago, mm -hmm. that we may have zones in here that are not yeah. currently being used. Is that okay? Yes. Um, they, they possibly could be used at a later date, so. But is it okay that we do that? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you, the, the only uh, the only option to that would be to add them as we go. So. Well, my concern was adding them as the go as we go is we may be faced with trying to close the gate after the cows have already gotten out, and or three, the cows have already gotten in. An ordinance too. <clears throat> Excuse me. Three months to approve an ordinance or pass an emergency clause. Right, and, and then, then and then we would face the issues of taking away value and all those kinds of things. So well, I'm in favor of creating them ahead of time. Have to re-categorize, you know, at the as the uh, municipal league do that. Okay. <clears throat> at the bottom of page seven, I left the definition for bar empty because I I didn't find it in this. I thought that was odd. It's not in these regulations, but. Because our covenants have the word bar in them for permitted in certain commercial areas, I thought we ought to define what a bar is. And after looking at uh, a lot of state statutes that I didn't find the answer I was looking for in, and a couple others I found this definition to be an establishment in and on the premises for the consumption of alcoholic beverages by the drink or in broken or unsealed containers are sold. This shall also include tavern, saloon, pub, lounge, and other like described drinking establishments. I, I tried to think, does Arkansas even permit straight bars? Because it, that's, that's what I was going to bring up. They are there, but the drink ordinance specifically limited it to uh, dining establishments. So they can uh, seat 50 people, have a cool menu, a kitchen capable of. Uh, Preparing everything on the menu yeah. to, to yeah. avoid bars. So I don't think we I don't think we got bars in our I opinion. said our current covenant has the word bars in it. Okay. So that's why I put it in here. Yeah. So if we can't defend it, if we can't permit it, then I shouldn't it'd be one of those areas that we can't do we can't do that. I, I was, you know, in other words, the city would prohibit it even though the covenants might allow it. Apparently, yeah. Well, I think I don't. 
Don't they stay in a lot of I believe you could just take that out. Well, if the state doesn't allow it, how do you explain the ones that are down along Highway 23? Well, they're in Missouri for one thing. They've got trees. No, excuse me, down 62. Oh, okay. The Rock and Pig. That's, they got food. Yeah. Okay. It is basically a restaurant. But you've okay. got one uh, outside Barryville that just opened uh, during the summer. Uh, it was like a, a series of hotels. Yeah, yeah, that, that strip there. That, yeah. that little strip there. Is that a bar? They call it the something saloon. Yep. Oh, yeah. It was for rock bikers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Do I don't know. But they might serve food, you don't know. And you can well, be real yeah. you can't get a liquor license. You can't way. get you can't get a liquor license if all you have is a, a hot dog machine or you know, popcorn popper. So, they used yeah. to have a, they used to have a percentage that that a certain percentage of your revenue had to come from food, but they I think they took the percentage out. Yeah, there's no percentage. It the mm -hmm. The basic guideline is you have to meet the definition of a restaurant. Okay. So I probably should take this out of here. That's probably why it's so not. So you're saying that's state law. Yeah. That is state law. Okay. So that's probably you can't, why. You that's can't have a bar without a liquor have it. So. Tawny Town didn't have it because we can't be permitted anyhow. Yeah. yeah. Let's take it out. I'll just take it out. Okay. I don't know when to ask this question, but I'll ask it now. Sure. Sure. Uh, The, all right, I, the state prohibits us from contradicting by any city ordinance anything that's in a covenant? No. Uh, mm -hmm. um, what happens in a, in a suit is usually the judges, the courts, let the more restrictive rule apply. Uh, I actually posed that question to... Uh, to um, Justin, and he said he's never been asked that before, so he'd have to do some. Well, again, I know y'all tired of hearing about me and my previous experience, I'm not. but it, in not one time when we passed an ordinance or uh, ran the zoning ordinance uh, variation uh, that covenants were ever mentioned. Ever. Well, you probably did you have covenants over here? Yeah. yeah. But those were like private communities where you had covenants, weren't they? Well, you can have covenants. They well, there's subdivisions. They could be more restrictive you can have covenants than the city would allow. The city. So that's why. Well, I'm not talking about uh, uh, them being so restrictive. I'm talking about us being uh, handcuffed from making an ivory more restrictive. Um, I mean, I, I may not be How safe. could you be responsible for reading and knowing all the private covenants on any land? Well, well Jerry, when we get to the point where where we talk about specific restrictions, then it might be easier to, to have that discussion about, you know, is this more restrictive than the covenant allows? And well, well I, I, I brought this up at one of the other meetings. Is, okay. uh, you know, I, I mentioned specifically the house on... Uh, Holiday Island Drive that had a, a, a fifth wheel RV park next to the building. Okay. And I was told that the covenant, you can't prohibit that, that the covenants allow that. Right, all right. But, and my question again is can't we make something that's more restrictive? I mean, because when those covenants, there, there was no city. Uh, plus, right. you got how many, 13 to 15 units you can't find? All right. right. I think the answer is we could we can pass or, ordinances they that are more restrictive, right? But we can't pass an ordinance that allows something that's in that's prohibited in the in the um, covenant is the way I would approach it. Yeah. And, okay. Well, I don't have any problem with that be, because because I think we would be inviting um, a challenge. That, that the city was was illegally extracting value from the property owners in a particular unit by allowing something by ordinance that they as property owners decided they didn't want and put it in their unit covenant. Uh, yeah. 
Okay. I guess the, the classic example would be if a city passed an ordinance that said you can have a B&B any place. And, uh, and the covenants say, you know, that's, you're running a business in a residential area. So. Well, I mean, we, we've got that. Those are some, uh, there will be some serious discussions on those rentals and what oh, all. Yeah. Because, oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, the, the condo that I had up right down the street here was uh, owned by, uh, by residents or part time residents, and but they were uh, uh, managed by a business out of Eureka which advertised them on that website, also listed them on Airbnbs, and if, if what Nan sent out is, is precedent, I mean, that's all people have to do. Well, Just, the, what I'm following when I'm clipping articles is there's so much still up in the air with, between the state and what cities are doing, and there's been some guidance that we could probably take from Fayetteville and Little Rock that they've done their homework and there are some things we could do. I don't know what they are, so I haven't studied that specifically. But some of the things that are in those, I've tried to include in here, like trying to define what short-term means, because that term wasn't here, but we're gonna talk about short-term rentals. So that's one of the definitions I added. Okay, top of page eight. I added the definition for bedroom because there are ways to control in an area of living of how many people are in a building. And some cities have chosen two persons per bedroom or so many people in the whole house by bedroom. So I thought having a bedroom definition of a room for use as living quarters within a dwelling that includes a closet and requisite number of exterior windows of sufficient size and placement to conform to the National Fire Code. I did that because there were people that could claim this four by six closet is a bedroom. So I put two people in it. But I said it should have a window and a closet according to the fire code to define what a bedroom is. Is that okay? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's standard to have a, a, a window as an egress. Couldn't, couldn't a dining room then qualify as a bedroom? If it doesn't have a closet and a window, it can't. Oh, the closet. I didn't, I thought about, does it have to have a door? But I thought, no, I won't go that far. But I think that the uh, realtors can't claim anything as a bedroom that doesn't have a window and a, a closet. Uh, in the community I came from, a basement room couldn't be a bedroom unless the window was a certain height off the floor mm -hmm. and a certain distance from the ground up above. That's exactly right. That's where the, when we lived in Enid, Oklahoma, that was the... We had a ma major, uh, uh, major guest bed, uh, bedroom, but couldn't count it as a bedroom. Because it didn't meet the National Fire Code or their building codes. So that's why I added the definition for bedroom. It made it good. Uh, building height. I put that in blue. Uh, the vertical surface from grade plane to the average height of the highest roof surface. That's different language that's in the covenants. I think every covenant says the house can't be above 25 feet above the highest point on the lot, something like that. I was gonna copy that text if, if, uh, if I should do that. So our building height ordinance should probably read like the covenants do, rather than this. It's so many feet above the highest point on the lot. All the covenants have that language. Yeah, because otherwise, how, how do you define the grade plane on a slope floor? Well, you, you take the survey and you take the highest point, the lowest point, and divide it by two. That's how you get an average. Is that the grade plane? Because in the uh, oh, the, okay. in the building code, I think, or maybe it's in this section, I read it someplace where uh, if you're going to build a house on a lot, you have to provide a uh, the gradient map. Uh, what, what do you call that? The slope plan of the lot, whatever it's called. So you have to show what those elevations are on your lot. Okay. All right. So you're going, to, you're going to reword that? To yeah, I'll, I'll line it up with what the text from the covenant say about the highest point on the lot. Okay. Carports. Let, let me just make one yes. observation. There's a lot up here on the state line 
right before you get to the four-way stop where it's like goes down like this, but yes. they all in dirt and they're creating a level spot. Mm -hmm. The highest point of that lot is going to be the street. The street. Mm -hmm. so, so they could build up to 25 feet above that, that street level. Okay. That's what our covenants have. And that would have been very, I guess the restriction would have been the same thing. The grade plane, the average height for the highest roof surface. So it's just a different reference point. This is talking about a grade plane versus the highest point. Is 25 feet two stories? Is that what it is? I think it's under two stories plus a roof. Okay. Because you, you figure nine feet for four, mm -hmm. then the pitch of roof on top. Carports, it's a subject that we've had in several conversations, whether it's over coffee or even in this room. So whether it's metal. Yeah. It has to be well, what do you do about carports, guys? It has to be connected to the house, doesn't it? No. It doesn't say that in the covenants. Hmm. I think it says it in the planning commission's regulations. I think so I read you could that someplace. set it away from the house and have a place to park a boat or something? And that's the question. Right? Yeah, that's the question. What are we going to have in our zoning for carports? You want, you want, you want a suggestion? You want a room? Yeah, that's, that's we're having conversation, discussion. Uh, uh, the building, the building code prohibits metal carports. Okay. Is it a space for housing and storing of motor vehicles and enclosed and not more than two sides by walls? Is that what's in our building code? Um, I don't know that the building code specifies what a legal carport is, exactly. but it says what you can't have, and you can't have a metal standalone carport. Okay. So it needs to be attached to the, the... I thought it had to be attached to the residence. Is there a reason uh, that it has to be, it can't be a metal freestanding, or a, even just a metal with four poles, if it's right up next to the house? It was... I guess deemed to be aesthetically um, acceptable. Because there are some units where that wouldn't be unacceptable at all, it wouldn't seem. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I think the building code says except in unit one. Uh, but the definition here, is that what you had or is that what was already there? It was already there. All I did was highlight the blue just to bring it up. Uh, that's what County Town uses as a description of a carport. The only other thing you, you, you know, you get by that other, it must be a similar, you know. Needs to be attached in a similar a roof. Similar roof, yeah. so consistent roof. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're saying that it, that it allows the carport to be separated from the residence. <clears throat> this is a definition of the word. We have to I, I guess I could do a word search and find out where else it is in the in the, uh, uh, in the reg. We're going to run across it at some point. They're just defining. I would say as a, a similar material as the as the residence or something. Well, that's more of a regulation rather than a definition, though. Huh? That's more of a regulation than a definition. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about defining how and how to be constructed and whatever. So. Just keep it in mind, so we'll leave it on here for now, that uh, we have to keep it in mind as we go down through it. Okay. Okay, scrolling down then, in, near the bottom of page nine, the definition under dwelling, single family. They have text in theirs that, that says, not including travel trailers, mobile homes, and manufactured housing less than 24 feet wide. Where are you? Dwelling, single family, near the bottom of page nine. So a single family dwelling is a dwelling designed for or occupied by one family only and being on a permanent foundation. And then they put a comma, not including travel trailers. Well, maybe, it, okay, maybe I misread it. They're probably saying that a single family home is a home, but it doesn't include trailers and mobile right. homes and manufacturing. Okay, so that text is probably okay. And the only thing I thought I think the only thing I would take out of there is manufacturing you're less than 24 feet wide because that's saying you, then that, then you could have a manufacturer that was over 24 feet no yeah it does 
Yes, that's, that's exactly what it says. So if you had a manufactured home that was 30 25 feet, feet wide, feet, you'd be bad. It, it could be considered a single family dwelling. Yeah, so I think. I think we're safe in the regard that manufactured homes over 12 feet wide can't be pulled down the highway. Yeah, but they can be double wide and they you put them together. They can't be more than, the each section can't be more than 12 feet, but you can have three 12 foot sections, have a 36 foot wide home. Well, I think the, I think the one they had at the, the governor's mansion for a while was a tri, tri wide or something. Anyway, I don't know. Um, well, that's what's in there. So. I think, I think we're up. My concern when I wrote this was that it needs wording to prevent trailers upon foundations to be considered a single, considered a single family dwelling. And I think having the right understanding of what they're trying to say is that it does not include those. Is mobile home defined? Uh, yes, I believe it is. Let's scroll down here. Uh, so, mobile home is defined. I think you just say our manufactured housing in the Leave the less than 24 feet of wide off of there. Yeah, both of those are defined also. So. Manufacturing housing is too. Yep, it's in there too. And you're covered. Why would you want to exclude? Well, there are some manufactured, well, I don't know what they call them, but when they, they bring the sections of the house on a flatbed and they stack them all together, you end up with a house that's 32 foot by 60 feet. It's pre-manufactured. Mm -hmm. Are you going to tell me a pre-manufactured home of that style and that construction should not be considered a single family dwelling? A lot of places call those modular. There you go, modular. So that's, that's definitely different than a, a mobile home. Yes, it is. Is the word adult defined? Adult? Uh, I build a modular. Uh, nope. Not specifically adult. Very fine. Would you take that to mean the person over the age of 18? If that was just the wall. Well, I think we could probably rely on some state statutes that define the word adult. We uh, may have to put it in here. You're about the well, I'm, I'm thinking of the family the that has a college kid who lives in the basement and sleeps on a fold out couch. Well, you got manufactured housing defined as manufacturing you know, has a minimum width of twenty one when you make so that's consistent with what you got down here. So, uh, well, um, in that situation, they would be violating the single family dwelling. I don't, uh, I don't yeah. think I don't think it's an issue. Okay, and the next one under townhouse or row house, I added the word contiguous roof oh, well, yeah. because of, in dwelling, townhouse or row house, the very next definition, and the triplex definition. Mm -hmm. On page nine. Yes. Yep. So the two or more single or multi-story dwelling units attached at the side or sides or contiguous roof. What I had in mind was they could build a duplex or a triplex that has carports between them, but doesn't have, they're not truly attached, yeah. but they're under a contiguous roof. Yeah. Well, the Wedgwoods, uh, they do have, some of those have carports between the units that have a but they have Covered. contiguous roof. Okay. A contiguous, there is a contiguous roof. So I thought it'd be okay to put that in here. I thought that would help describe how we want the, yeah. them to be built in Holiday Island. Okay. You don't have that on the duplex side, do you? Um, the contiguous roof is not there. Well, um, it says townhouse row, two or more single multi-story dwelling. Okay, you're right. Well, I, well, I suppose... Yeah. Duplex is a separate item. Oh, yeah, up here. There's quadplex, multifamily. I've got more. No, they're up, I'm just rolling up above. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I see. Um, oh, yeah, I did have that under attached dwelling or dwelling attached, a dwelling that is joined to another 
at one or more sides by a wall or walls, and then I added or contiguous roof. So that would cover the duplexes. Okay. Okay. Again, these are our zoning ordinances. How do we want duplexes and triplexes built? We want them to have a continu yeah. contiguous roof. Okay. All right, next page, uh, at the bottom of page 10, under group residential, I have the word residential occupancy. So it says the use of a site for residential occupancy by groups of more than five persons, not defined as a family. Typical uses include residence halls, boarding, or lodging houses. Would that new drug center in the park fall in that category? I don't know if they live there or not. They do. They, they have a kitchen and bedrooms and bathrooms and I where think you because they are living there. Yeah, they live there. Where okay. you uh, just the definition for group so residential. The old medical plaza across from the post office next to the elks in the park. It's a it's a drug rehab facility now. And they live in the facility. Oh uh, yeah, they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like are all the time. I just added the word residential because the word down in front is group residential. So okay, we're gonna have residential occupancy rather than temporary or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just wanted to make it clear. I thought. Okay, That's next not... page: hotel or motel. The concern I have is we may need to include. We to, uh, we're gonna rent our motel out by the hour. <laughs> <laughs> Ken's not going to pay for an hour when he only needs a half hour. Uh, <laughs> half price. <laughs> We're recording. Yeah, that, that's on tape, Dan. <laughs> I included the end or short term accommodations because of the articles I've been clipping from newspapers and what's going on in the state about VRBO and Airbnb that they are either considered or not considered hotel or motel type business. And it might be that uh, we should have the words short term included in the definition. I think that's fine. If you're gonna put short term in there, then you gotta determine, define short term. It is, later on. Is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> what about a hotel that has permanent people? Does that? Permanent residents. Oh. Mm. That short term. Would that that you know the statue road in? Yeah, there has there, some there permanent several, apartments. not several, but two or three mm -hmm. over on sixty two mm -hmm. that they make permanent convert those I, efficiency apartments. I, yeah. I, and and uh, uh, our hotel here, he's doing the same. He's to the back side. I was going to just say he's going to have some uh, or. Uh, permanent apartments because of the housing shortage, and uh, he basically put his staff up in them, and then he's going to have the hotel rentals up front. In in this uh, in zoning, that would be like R two, be multifamily. They'd have to be a, an R two type accommodation for this long term living in more than one family in the same roof under the same roof. What, what, that kind of brings up the question of what, what would we do in the case of a, a structure, uh, improved, improved structure that falls into two categories? What happens in, from what I've read is that it's considered a um, non-conforming use. And what Dan had talked about, that we have uh, regulations in place that say when that non-conforming use changes, then it reverts to the... To what it, it has to change to what it's going to be it can't be extended so you they they're they're over there as a c2 or something they're operating non-conforming if it's a, if it's a residential but if they, area if they operate part of it as a r3 then it's a non-conforming for the c2 and or, or the r3 temporarily at least yeah or vice versa yeah so, I think the VRBO Airbnb thing is going to have to be a different definition in here, a definition unto itself. Where is that? One? As opposed to call it one. hotel and motel. Mm. Oh, yeah, I think it has to be separate too. Because all I did for short term was not a short term rental, but I just had the term short term to define the time frame. Mm -hmm. 
And there would probably be a definition that we create when we do the zoning for short-term rental. What does that mean? Could, uh, we, could we call those vacation rentals or but, something like that? Yeah. The state defines short-term rentals as anything less than 30 days. Mm -hmm. Right. But, um, I mean, instead I of think, using the commercial brand name of Airbnb, right. vacation rental maybe. Yeah. I think he had it. Does everybody want to agree then it's probably okay to leave and short term accommodations in that definition? Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Did we get somebody in? No? Nobody in? Okay. When we look at the definition under lot, there's one uh, for interior. I added any lot which is not a corner lot. And then as I read through the rest of the regulations, they talk about double frontage. That's a house that has a street on its front and back side. There, we do does. have some of those out here. Yeah, mine does. Not by your lot. Your lot line, there's a lot line behind you, right? Your lot goes from Rocky Top Circle all the way down to Beaver. Beaver. Yeah. That's one lot. Okay. And there's there's at least one house on North Star Roof that's that way. Too. I got two lots like right that. Okay. So because later on in the regulations we're talking about setbacks, we're talking about fences, we're talking about outbuildings, it talks about interior lots. So I thought we need to include the double frontage ones here. That's why I added the word. Okay. Mobile home description then in, on page 12. I'm concerned about the text that says, well it describes it, and then <clears throat> it talks about mobile homes that are uh, built prior to 1974, so what are they called when they build them after 1976? Manufactured home. That's a HUD definition. Okay. The same thing, but it's just HUD. I think the HUD reg regulations were in, in 1976 or never seen. I had a claim on it one time. I can't really remember. It's been a long time. But I think that's what it is. Okay. Is they call them manufactured homes after that, even though they're the same thing. Okay, so because we the word mobile home occurs in the text we talked about a few minutes ago, it has a definition, but we also talked about manufactured housing, which is defined up above, so we're probably okay. But right. do we want to put in what we talked about, the modular homes, because according to the definition of a mobile home, you could, you could call this modular home the same, because it's transported from the factory. Okay. Uh, so that makes it factory built fabricated before 1976. Well, okay, no. I think that definition, they, if you look, <laughs> it's, that's the part that's 1976. Yeah. It's going roll, to roll back to page 11. Three definitions from the bottom. Manufactured housing unit is a detached single family housing unit fabricated in an off-site manufacturing facility for installation or assembly at the building site as a permanent structure, blah, blah, blah. I think that's our modular home we're looking for. Okay. They call it manufactured housing unit. Again, I, when I read through this stuff, thinking, well, you know, they've gone through the test of time in writing their regulations that a lot of this is probably pretty well thought out. So a mobile home cannot be a travel trailer. A long travel trailer. Right. No. It can't be. Okay. It has to be something that's... Like a recreation. You can, it's something. movable, but it's... You put it on a foundation someplace? Mm -hmm. Or do you have to put it on a foundation? In Holiday Island? No, I mean, anywhere. I mean, can't you just no, that, stick it on a lot and put some... That's what a lot of people do that. ...order around that? Yep, a lot of people do that. I think it's registered different. It's the only difference. I mean, if you put it, if you cut the tongue off and put it on a foundation, it's real property as opposed to personal property. So someone who buys a lot in Unit 1 and... Uh, pulls a mobile home into it themselves and just parks it there and landscapes around it. Good to go. What's that called? <laughs> I don't know. Until <laughs> <laughs> that we don't know. And almost until they get a permit. <laughs> <Yeah, right. laughs> <laughs> it's that's called Airboats and Lightroom. I don't think that's called illegal. That's covered 
as covered in our definition, is not a single family dwelling. That's right. No. It's not a single family dwelling. It's not allowed. So when we get oh, to the okay. regulations about single family dwellings, you can't take a motorized vehicle or a towed vehicle and put it on a foundation and call it a single family dwelling. So even though we allow mobile homes in unit one, 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 one and two, one, one is on top. Two is grandfathered. Two is grandfathered. grandfathered. They're in there now. Yeah, they're in there now. One, one you can pull them in and park them in Tucson. Uh, so it can't be that it, it, we can't oh. have those in number one. What? Yes, we can. Homes. So mobile homes. So, so they could tow it there, park it, landscape it, and they're done. Apparently, in, in one, if we, if we write it that way. Okay. So what is the building code will still require that it be on foundation? So what is a mobile home after 1976? We just talked about that. It's a manufactured home. home. Manufactured home, but there's a lot of different types. Of yes, there are. Well, <laughs> that's true. Hot damn, hot. So under the covenant says mobile homes. That's that's part of what I said here. The covenants and conditional use isn't clearly defined in our covenants. That's one of the struggles we have in saying can't take this text from a covenant and make it a zoning ordinance. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Somewhere I'm getting lost here. We're, we're down to the assisted living facility, right? Yes, I added the words under nursing home, any premise including assisted living facilities where more than three persons are housed and furnished with meals and continuing nursing services. Okay. That's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Next. peach tree would be a nursing home? Well, and when we talk about when we talk about zoning, if we use the word nursing home, it would include peach tree as an assisted living. It would fit into that category. So we don't have an assisted living. I didn't find one. Okay. Is anybody can anybody flip quicker than I can scroll? There's not there's no assisted living facility described, is there, for a definition in the A's? Well, what would you uh, I don't think there was. in that they have homes up at Peach Tree that can be bought? Uh, Those are duplexes, aren't huh? there? Well, there's things, there's like single family small homes. Yeah, there's some single family residents there. You didn't no, know. There's no, no, they're duplexes. There there are okay. they all duplexes? I didn't know that. Okay. Um, so, th would, would those be called a nursing home? Or would no, those be like called those. Those would be duplexes. residences. Residences, yeah. even mm -hmm. though they're connected to the same. Well, they might, be, they might be serviced by them, but this yeah, has a service. premises where they. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They're not in a they're in a different premises. So it's the building we're talking about. Right. Okay. okay. Near the bottom of page thirteen under retail slash service. All that yellow text is what I drug out of our covenants. There are three different hmm. commercial types described in our covenants. They're named two of them are named the same, but they're different. And uh, I added those words because they're in our covenant so someone could find that use. From our covenant in our zoning regulations. And I think they fit the area of service and retail. Yeah. I don't think any of them are outside of that that group. So you've been you've done a lot of research on the covenants, I know. Do they exclude businesses other than the ones that are listed in the covenant? Or do they have to fall into a bookshop, an antique shop, or whatever? In our covenants, there's no uh, exclusions, no restrictions of what kind of business. They only show what's permitted. In our so zoning... If they permitted these, do they exclude others then? Not in our covenants. That's what that means? Right. These are just examples? These are the words that are in our covenants. These are the kinds of business that our covenants have. And, and this just says typical uses right. include... So it doesn't just, say exclusive use. Right. You can have anything else. That you so, the, so, so if you have something in mind, uses? I mean, like one, a butterfly shop or something, I mean, that I'm kind sure of thing. I'm sure there are other kinds of dispensary. shops. Right. right. Marijuana dispensary. No, we don't I thought it. about that. Not yet there well, yet. well, well I mean, that, we're, we're not planning for today. I, mean, I know, but you, you don't have to use. define it. You, you, you can, that's just an example. These are just typical uses, so. That's fine. It doesn't have to be all in We can, when that example that Jerry just named can be one of those listed. 
under conditional. That section is called special conditions applicable to certain uses. They have adult entertainment, farm animals, car washes, hobby chickens. Dispensaries could be another one of ours that we have. I am. Uh, You're not in a residential area. That would be part of our uh, zoning ordinance that would not permit it if that's what we chose to do. Okay. Under the salvage yard, I just added words of things that I see in the salvage yard on the way to Berryville, just so that they're covered. Because he's talking about the. This is talking about uh, scraps and discard pieces of metal, inoperable wrecks, scrap, ruined well, automobiles, automobile parts, and they left out the boats and the campers and the mobile homes. Okay. And, and I didn't put buses on here. I probably should include that. No, I think I think we got a few places that we'll just re re rezone them into junkyards instead of houses. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, you're not going to come up with an exhaustive list of right. no. things that people would collect. Okay, but I okay. would think that a, a salvage junk record yard uh, needs to be uh, fenced to where it's not an eyesore like that place in very in, well, in 162, wrecking, salvage, and junkyards, I took all the text out. There's uh, like six or seven pages defining how junkyards yeah. are going to be regulated. This is just the definition now, okay. the actual regulation. Okay, so top of page 14, short term, a period of time less than or equal to 30 days. Yeah, just simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Okay. Under street, I add this because it may need to be different based on what we have in ours. The text says the word street or road are synonymous. No, I added that. I don't know what I did here for sure. I like it. This is all my text, I think. Good. Or it's a mix of the two. Yeah, I screwed up the highlighting. <clears throat> We said in our master street plan, road street plan, that they're used synonymously. So I want to make sure that our definition, when we talk about streets and our ordinances, they can't be misconstrued. Okay. In the uh, impound yard, I added motorhomes and motorcycles to the list. Next page. Under vehicle and equipment sales, I included or added camper and motor home sales and trailer sales. Not just boats and cars and trucks. Okay. And surprisingly, that went about three hours quicker than I thought it would. That's the end of page 15, the end of the definition. Did a good job. Thank you. Uh, and it's four o'clock. What does that mean? It means uh, to bedtime. Nap time. It means we bed. It's, oh, I know. It's happy hour. <laughs> okay. Before yeah. we get, we already went over the bar thing. We don't have any. Of if we're going to go longer and cover anything else, I just want to make certain that uh, we talk about today, if not in discussing it, but to be aware, we've got to get to the board of zoning adjustment or the Zoning Board of Adjustment, or whatever we're going to call it, so that we're, we name it the same in all of our documents and, and how we're going to do it. Because as soon as we start approving permits, things are going to be nice and shiny and clean, and everybody's going to be happy. As soon as we say no, then we have to have an avenue for our builder or property owner to go to, and that's the Board of Zoning Adjustment. Can we, can we start meeting once a week? I, I think, think every Wednesday and then every Thursday and I every Friday we need work work session. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna All ask day. You, my question was gonna be what is your plan for completing this and what time frame are we gonna be on here? I think man. Well what what I had thought we would do is as we go through this, if if this order is appropriate arrangement of these texts and we go through and discuss them and we think we're pretty much in agreement I can draft the resolution to adopt these a section at a time and an ordinance for the city to approve and they become 
Our zoning ordinance is a section at a time. Why, why don't we have work sessions instead of regular meetings? Well, this was uh, the right time to use this time for our business. Well, I know, but I'd say for subsequent ones uh, to, to work on this, I think we yeah. just use work sessions. That would work. I mean, um, or we could actually call formal meetings and you know make make decisions and approve stuff. Yeah, I I don't know if there's any benefit in having a work session as opposed to as many regular meetings as what we need. Uh, <coughs> then the, you could yeah. I, are we gonna have, we're gonna do these under emergency clauses, right? We're gonna have to. Right. Well, we can, except for the sections that have penalties and fees in them, and those we're not permitted to. So then, there ain't any way in heck to have them done by January. Oh, there's no way it'll happen by January because of the time. This is already that's, November 12th. That's November basically 9th. why we passed the emergency one that said we're going to use the zoning requirements you know, in the uh, covenants until we have more permanent. Well, we just need to, we need to schedule enough me meetings yeah, a week. A couple of meetings a week for the next two months? No, we need to schedule. Three of them. You need to schedule the two hour meetings and at least. Three. Yeah, so, you know, there's, there's 69 pages of material here. There's, there's a couple of them that I pasted in a couple of big charts that take up two or three pages, but. The materials here, if at least going through these first 15 pages, does it look like we're on the right track, guys? Mm -hmm. that, yes. That's what I'm after. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Because there's things I need to clean up that I haven't even worked on because they're they're defining these zones that we probably won't even have, and the, the table screwed up in the way it pasted in. So, and I got to put our own in it, not theirs. So there's a lot of work to do, but. You, Writing a writing a resolution and a proposed ordinance for the city council to consider is easy work compared to this. Um, How long has Tiny Town been a town? Or? They're old. They're old. Yeah, yeah it's, it's old. old. Um, and I haven't run any of this past our attorney because I leave that to our mayor to talk to. You know, maybe maybe Tiny Town has sections like they say. Yeah, 281 is really screwed up. We've been working on that for six months and haven't changed it yet. I hate to adopt something they're working on. Um, yeah, I don't know that Justin would know that. I don't know whether I'm calling Connie Town and ask him. I don't think. Okay. I don't think Justin would need to look at any of this other than the part where we're going to get into the penalties, and et cetera. I think the only, you know, the the possible conflict with the covenants is the area that I'm concerned about. But that's not. Yeah, you're still not going to have to look at all those details. Yeah, I I don't. I don't think so. I don't think we want to pay him on two hundred dollars an hour to read all this. Well, I, I took it from their website, and I think there was enough information on there to tell me it was current. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, with your permission, I'll call their secretary and start with her or him. I don't remember who it is, and um, see if they have any guidance on any <coughs> zoning ordinances that are troublesome to them. I think we need need to meet again next Tuesday and go through some more of this. Tuesday, if, if we were doing something Tuesday, that's uh, the same night as the uh, the uh, BOC quorum. I know, but that's at six o'clock. I know. Well, I know. we don't we don't golf on Tuesday anymore, so Tuesday morning <laughs> nine o'clock works for me. <laughs> at what? Oh, nine o'clock. We could work nine to twelve. We we should be able to knock out a I lot got, of this in I three hours. Parish council meeting at ten o'clock. What? Next Tuesday, I got parish council at 9 o'clock. I mean, 10 o'clock. And I got to set up for that meal, that meal that night. I don't get to go to the forum. Well, we could do it Wednesday morning. Wednesday's a, is, I get for me. Never have anything to do with Wednesday's that. okay for me. Wednesday, next Wednesday, 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock? What day is that? I mean, what? Saturday the 17th. 
At what time, Dan? Said nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. I think if we if we sit down for three hours, I think we can get through this. And we can adjourn to the farmhouse for lunch. There you go. Farmhouse bar. Because on top of you know, just doing the text, um, I need to number it appropriately. These numbers, like I said, the 14 is my invention because their regulation was a 153. But the three numbers behind was theirs. But there's been a suggestion I need to number it differently to fit the, the muni code style. So that'll take a little bit of time. But I got to have the paragraphs in the right spot before I renumber the whole thing. Because um, there are references I got to keep track of. You said. We don't need to deal with the appendixes right now, right? Um, you said, yeah, I, I set them off. We don't need to worry about flag standards. <coughs> and the appendix B, that's the one that's the big chart of uh, setbacks and what have you. That's why I handed out this little I had little sheet. Yeah, if you, I built a spreadsheet that kind of looked like that handout, would that be OK? Yeah. Because to me, it's really easy to read. Yeah. And the setbacks are a little chart on the side. So I think maybe I'll have some sort of style like that rather than text. Sure. It's just a sample of what and this came from uh, uh, this handout, this arrangement so came from Silent Springs. So mm -hmm. the a unit zone use unit one is agriculture, right? Yes. If I'm looking at the On theirs, yes. Okay. The, the key is down below and the P says that's permitted in, in yes. those kind of zones. Okay. Yes. All right. So what the the language I think is in the regulation, if it's permitted use, they don't have to come and get a permit. They they're just well, no, they don't. That's not how it, they, they don't have to come and ask for a conditional use, right? Because it's permitted, they still right. need a permit, but they don't have. All to they have to do is get a permit to build or yeah, whatever. and there should be no exception for them being granted that permission. Yeah. It should be easy for the code enforcement officer to say, yep, that's clear. Hey, yeah, yeah, that's wrong. Because uh, well, I, I copied this one because it had some suggestions on it just in the regard of coming up with a chart on the right hand side for setbacks. And then down below, um, there are there's language in our covenants about the house can't be over a certain percentage of the lot that it's on. And you can't build a 10,000 square foot house on a 12,000 square foot lot, that kind of thing. So, I just could use it for guidance. If, if that arrangement in our ordinances would be okay. It's a lot easier to read now. I think so too, yeah. chart form. I'll try to work on that then. So, you have the text then. You have the 69 pages. Yep. Um, it would go fast if you guys have looked at what I've highlighted as concern for me. Yep. Highlight your own concerns. So we talk about more than just what I'm concerned about. And we'll, we'll just do, we'll like, go the, next, top. Yeah, the we, section will be, which one are we doing next time? Well, we're going to do three hours. We're going to get through a lot of this. 100? So, yeah, we'll do, we'll go all the way through the 100s. All right, let's back up to that. If I'm going to put, shall we stick with what's in the covenants? It's R-1, R-2, R-3, and their descriptions. The problem I have with that, it's exactly opposite the way they constructed theirs. Because they talk about the arrangement is in the least restricted to the most restricted. And so it would turn our definitions upside down, following their format. And I don't know how to flip theirs over to make it match what we got. But we can't change the unit. Covenants. We wouldn't, but we can so put a chart on in our. Well, we can put a chart on regulation that says covenant R one equals city R three or whatever. That would be very. I know it'd be tough, but when you're reading the covenant, you won't know what uh, reading. Why would? Uh, it doesn't make any difference as long as we know that the that the um, ordinance or the regulations aren't in conflict with the covenants, what difference does it? Yeah, I contemplated calling it something totally different, ABC yeah, instead of R123. I just think uh, people out here are going to be reading both their covenants 
Yeah. And they're going to be reading our ordinances to see yeah. what they can and can't do. Okay. So hopefully, hopefully over time, they will read the covenants less and less. Well, and, uh, I'll see what I can do. Zoning, you know, it, it really impacts new construction and somebody that's intending to do something that violates, you know, the regulation. So it doesn't really, 90% of the people out here and 95% of the people out here are never going to care. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're never, they're never going to build anything. They never looked the at the neighbor in never looked at the covenant. Well, and that's how they found mine the other day. And the language that's in this document that I worked with, I might be able to reconcile that by taking that little paragraph out that it doesn't have to do with the fact that it's more restricted or less. Because when we look at this chart, the permitted zones are the R1 are going two boxes. You get down to R4, there's four boxes. So you can see there's less, you know, less uh, less requirements in it. There's more things permitted in R4 in Silent Springs than there is in R1. So, so I'll just fix that. I'll just I'll I'll work on fixing that. So you're saying well, so as you proceed down from R1 to R4 in Silent Springs, it's less but restrictive. In there, it's less restrictive. Right. So RE is more restrictive than R2. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, R2 has three of them uh, that are marked yellow, or four rather, versus three. But it, if we were just to use our zoning code, we would use only, we'd only have R1, R2, R3. Right. right? And then a couple of commercials. is probably so, the most restrictive. For us. I mean, are, are, is there a more restrictive or less restrictive thing about R1 to R2 and R3? It has to do with the carports and the accessory buildings and the fences and the setbacks. They're more. I would think that would an R from being in a unit in rather than being an R1 versus an R3. And that's the that's the comfort that's the conflict that I have unit. Three, R1, whatever. It also has C2 and 3 in it, or C1 and C2. Yeah. We're going to mark these by lot. We're not going to draw a big circle around these lots or this unit and say it's all R1. We're going to paint them different colors because they're zoned that way in the ordinance. We're going to create zoning order, or they're zoned that way in the covenants. So we mark all R1s a certain color. Yeah. Or all and the C2s are going to be a different color. Yeah. And there is, there is one, maybe some semi-important reason to have our ordinance match the uh, covenant zoning because that's how high said assessor's property is. By R1, R2, R3, C1, C2. So that would be an opportunity for confusion Okay. If the city, if the city uh, zoned my property R three, but the district was was uh, assessing me as an R one in their world, it will get really confusing to, especially to new people that move here. I, I, I guess where I'm coming from is that when I think of R one versus R three. R3 is a multi-family apartment building. R1 is a single-family dwelling. Where does the more restrictive or less restrictive stuff come in to play? What makes R1 less restrictive or more restrictive than R3? In these regulations, I believe there's text in there that talks about how many vehicles can be parked in front or the length of the driveway. Uh, it has to do with the way the, the properties are used. That they they have more freedoms in R3 than they do in R1 in these regulations. So as we get through them, we'll recognize those differences and we'll say, yeah, that doesn't really fit here, or it does. We'll have to fix it. But that's not going to be reflected in the chart. No, the, the chart just identifies at a quick glance what's permitted in that region. So it's just that when I was reading this and, and came to that section that I, I don't remember where it's at now, it, it's... It's upside down from the way that they're constructed and named here. Okay. So I'll, I'll have to reconcile that. Okay. Well, let's, let's look it. at it when we get to it. Yeah.
and you mentioned R one, R two, and R three. Where does the time series fit? In their own. They have their own. They have T. Okay. <laughs> They're T H for the townhouses, and they got separate because there are separate covenants. Um, Wedgwood is separate from across the street, whatever they're called, is separate from what you got at Table Rock. I don't find a covenant for Table Rock. Well, do. Wedgwood, Wedgwood is a. It's um, an HOA. I know, but those are our ones, aren't they? I don't remember. I mean, those. Oh, wait a minute. I do this on the charts on the piece of paper. Each unit is an R1, maybe? They aren't counting on I know that. Um, they're marked Ironwood Townhouse and Oak Point Townhouse and Wedgwood Townhouse. They're not R1, 2, or 3. And I named them in our scheme TH for Townhouse W. Well, they're assessed as an R1. Well, I don't know about assessment. I, <laughs> I don't know about what lawyers do. Some people pay the R1 assessment. People that own these townhouses. Well, so does the Timeshares, so. mm -hmm. time shares, except they do have their own category for assessment. Yeah, but there are one. Because they don't pay the sewer debt like the other R1 does. Well, they ought to pay 10 times. Then, well, yeah. well, we well, always they talk each about get, that. Well, you know, the property one. owner gets their own activity card and own, you know, owner privileges. Yeah. Um, anyway. Well, we got a lot to look at. That's the point. Yeah. And I have people coming over at 4.30, so well, I'm going to be in trouble if we don't what adjourn well, here. here. Yeah. <laughs> so I need a covenant for 107, 109, and, and uh, 113, which is four divisions of Table Rock Landing. It's got four separate covenants on it, four separate units. Yeah, four there are. And I don't have a copy of any of those. What are we going to zone I don't know, like Table Rock Landing probably has restrictions on occupancy and so on, but I don't know about covenants. T.S. Call him T.S. <clears throat> I have a friend who owns one of those from Oklahoma. I'll see if he can. Is he one of the owners that you owns a one, one of the separate <laughs> units? <laughs> no. Wes, oh, he owns just a timeshare. Time Wes owns two of them. So. Oh, yeah, he probably does. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, so the, the, reason, the reason we need to zone those is because the next guy comes along might want to do something like it over here. We have to have a zone description for it and controls on it. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. I don't want to try to close the gate after they've gotten in. Yep. Okay. That's my viewpoint. Well, you propose something and then we can come yeah. back and discuss it and see if we can punch, put, punch holes in it. Or Here we go. Make it better. <laughs> Move to adjourn. All right, we've got a motion to adjourn. Jerry, do I have a second? Oh, I have a chat. Can I look at the chat? No. Oh, it was Jeanette. She says, I don't think those homes by Peachtree are part of them any longer. They all had to be bought. So, but I, that's kind of the way we were discussing it, that they're owned individually. So. I, have a a second. I have a motion. Second. Ken, second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you.